We're so excited that you're with us today. Uh, just a reminder before we jump in, uh, keep letting us know if you're, uh, if you're inviting people to church, let us know. Write that in your weekly handout. There's a line for it in there. And, and that just helps us know who to be praying for. Uh, and we're just praying that everybody would get in the habit of inviting people to every series and, and uh, just watch what God does with that. So we are in week four of a series called Foundations, a blueprint for extraordinary faithfulness. And as we get started, let me ask this question. Uh, how many of you here are fans of a good love story? You, you like a good love story. Hands up. Yeah, a few of you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there are great love stories out there. Uh, I'm kind of a sap. I like love stories. Uh, some of them are a little too cheesy, but you know, there's Romeo and Juliet. There's Gone with the Wind. There's you know, Beauty and the Beast. There's The Notebook. <laughs> the Notebook. Oh, the Notebook. <laughs> and of course, my favorite love story, Star Wars. Any Star Wars fans out there? You love a love story, so, okay? Uh, so, but whether you love or hate love stories, there's something in love stories that draws us in. It, it pulls at our heartstrings. It, they capture our attention. They capture our imagination. Today, I want to tell you a love story. I want to show you one of the world's best love stories, one of the most profound stories in the Bible, and it's tucked away. Many of you maybe have not, are not even familiar with it. It's tucked away in the Old Testament. It's the story of a prophet named Hosea. Uh, this is a story... Uh, of faithfulness. It's, it's nothing short of extraordinary. Ralph Waldo Emerson, the, the famous uh, poet and, and writer, made this observation. He said, the entire world loves a lover. The entire world loves a lover. If that's true, Hosea arguably could be the best loved book in the entire Bible. That's what we're going to dive into today. Turn to Hosea chapter 1. Uh, if you're using one of our Bibles, we'll be on page 500. And 32. If you didn't bring your Bible, just raise your hand. The ushers will bring you one. If you don't own one, please raise your hand. We'll give you one as a gift. If you're using your phone, uh, mobile device, U version, uh, it, under our events tab, all our notes are there as well. Uh, Hosea chapter 1. Hosea was a prophet. He was a spokesman for God. He lived uh, around 755 BC in Samaria, the capital city of the northern kingdom of Israel. And there's, during Hosea's life, Israel was incredibly prosperous. They were experiencing a season of peace as a nation. They were stable politically. They had a great military. Things were going well. Uh, you know, they're financially well off. But as a nation, they were morally bankrupt. They were caught up in idol worship, uh, particularly the worship of the god Baal. And that's Hosea's audience. That's where we're picking up this story. That's where we're entering the story. So Hosea chapter 1, starting with verse 1. The Lord gave this message to Hosea, son of Beeri, during the years when Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah were kings of Judah, and Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, was king of Israel. Now, let's just pause right there. I want you to note, the names are really important here. The reason the names are really important is because these are real kings. And the reason that's so important to note that these are real historical kings is that what is about to happen is so hard to believe that there are many people who like to assume it's an allegory. It's just a story. It's not actually... Uh, real historical events. And so the kings are actually listed here as evidence that what we're about to read is something that actually happened historically, okay? So let's keep reading verse 2. When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, go and marry a prostitute so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. Now, whoa, whoa, whoa. Pastor Phil, you said this was a great love story the world's best love story. That does not sound like the opening line of the world's best love story to me. I mean, here's this guy, he's a young man, he's looking forward to getting married, starting a family, and God asks him to do something crazy. Something that, that God had never asked anybody to do before, and as far as I, I'm sure, uh, certain, he's never asked anybody to do since then. He says, marry someone who you know will not remain faithful. Now, isn't that just what every young man dreams of? I mean, this is not what he was looking for. You take a look at any relationship on planet Earth, and you'll find a common denominator, something that everybody looks for when they're looking for that, that person, that the person they're going to spend their life with. When you peel back all the layers, you look under the surface, it all comes down to one thing. We want to love someone and to be loved back. It's what we want. It's how we're wired. We want to love someone and be loved back. I think that's what Hosea wants in his life. I don't think that surprises you that that's what he would want. What we often forget is that God wants the same thing. God wants to love you, and he wants you to love him back. Unfortunately, that's not what's happening 
in this story. Here Hosea is, he's God's spokesperson, and God is looking out at his people, and his people are turning their backs on him, and they're worshiping false gods. They're being unfaithful, and God is heartbroken. That's the context here. So let's read all of verse 2. When the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, go and marry a prostitute so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. This will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. Let let me translate that a little bit. He's saying to Hosea, I want you to feel what I feel. Like, I don't just want you to, to know what Israel's doing. I don't want you just to speak for me. I want you to feel the pain that I am feeling, to try to be able to, to know what I'm going through. God's people had turned away from him, and yet God loves them so passionately, so intensely, he's willing to go to incredible extremes to get their attention. And so Hosea's life is going to serve as an illustration of Israel's unfaithfulness to God. Now, marriage has always been a metaphor in Scripture. It's, it's common throughout Scripture. Uh, God will use the picture of the bride and the groom as a metaphor for God and his bride, the church. But here, it's like all new level, okay? It's, he takes it very literally. Now, nothing is said here about how, how Hosea feels about all this. Nothing is said about how he went about carrying out this command. All we know is that he did it. And what we learn about Hosea here. Uh, you know, how he, how he processed through this information, we'll never fully know. But what we know is that he had extraordinary strength to suffer through this for the sake of remaining faithful to God. Hosea's life serves as a blueprint of faithfulness, even when God calls us to the unthinkable. Maybe you've had that in your life, where you feel like what God is asking you to do, you just can't even imagine. It's, it's crazy. Hosea gives us an example of how do you have faith when God calls you to do the unthinkable. So let's look at verse 3. So Hosea married Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she became pregnant and gave Hosea a son. Now, some scholars honestly really struggle with this. Some say there was no real Gomer. Uh, they believe that this must have been a parable, a made-up story to teach a spiritual lesson. And, and by the way, they believe this not because that's what the text indicates. They believe this because they simply can't wrap their head around this, that God is essentially saying, Hosea, take a wife. As soon as you do, she'll cheat on you and leave you and love others more than you. And she'll find her satisfaction everywhere else. Because by the way, that's what my people are doing. So Hosea marries someone he knows won't love him back. Now at first, things are pretty good. You know, I mean, all things considered, God blesses their union. He gives them a son. And then God gives Hosea another command. He says, name the boy Jezreel. Okay, now that might not mean anything to us today. But at the time this was written, that would have set an incredibly clear message that that God was using this family as an object lesson. You see, Jezreel was associated with the wicked king Ahab and Jezebel. And just to give you some context to try to put it in perspective for you, naming this kid Jezreel would have been similar to a Jew, a Jewish family, naming their son Dachau or Auschwitz after the World War II concentration camps. That's the profoundness of what's happening here. But he obeys. And he names his son. Still, he's got a son with a tough name, but life was pretty good. Well, that changed quickly. Verse 6. Soon Gomer became pregnant again and gave birth to a daughter. Now, now listen, notice what it did not say. Verse 3 says she gave Hosea a son. Verse 6 says she became pregnant again and gave birth to a daughter. It does not say it was Hosea's daughter. The indication both here and in verse 9 is that these kids are not Hosea's children, that she has indeed been unfaithful. Let's keep reading verse 6. And the Lord said to Hosea, Name your daughter Lo-Ruhamah, not loved, for I will no longer show love to the people of Israel or forgive them, but I will show love to the people of Judah. I will free them from their enemies, not with weapons and armies or horses and charioteers, but by my power as the Lord their God. After Gomer had weaned Lo Ruhama, she again became pregnant and gave birth to a second son. Again, not Hosea's son. And the Lord said, Name him Lo Ami, not my people, for Israel is not my people, and I am not their God. This is where God starts pointing the finger. Gomer's actions are a picture of Israel's spiritual condition. They chased after other gods and abandoned their commitment to God alone. And so God reflects this in the naming of these children. Lo Ruhama means no mercy. Lo Ami means not my people. Just as Gomer has shown uh, Hosea no mercy and, and these children are not his children, so God's people have shown him no mercy and they are 
turning away from their place. They're rejecting their place as children of Almighty God. And God is sending a clear message to Israel, and it's a clear message to you and me today. And the message is this. Quit being a gomer. Gomer is a picture of every lost sinner pursuing their own lusts and forgetting the God who loves them. And he's saying, quit being a gomer. James chapter 1, verse 14, 15 says, Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. There's a huge lesson to be learned here. Substitutes never satisfy. Substitutes never satisfy. Judd Wilhite is a pastor in Las Vegas. He said it this way. He says the substitutes we put in our lives that take the place of God never satisfy. They don't satisfy us and they don't satisfy him. See, God wants a personal relationship with you. He wants you. He loves you. He created you. He wants you. And nothing will satisfy him but you. And yet, how often do we settle for substitutes? How often nothing will satisfy him but us, and nothing will satisfy us but him, and yet we settle for substitutes? Let me illustrate this in in kind of a fun way. Food substitutes are the new rage, and I'm not talking about protein bars. I'm talking about, for some reason, as a nation, we've decided we need to take actual food and make pretend versions of it and eat that instead. Let me give you some examples, and I'm going to start with the most acceptable, and we're going to go down to this is disgusting, okay? So here we go. Any cereal fans out there? Okay, you want cereal, you don't have time in the morning? Cereal to go, man. Just get the cereal bar, right? Which, by the way, is not half bad, but think about this. It's cereal on top, it's cereal on the bottom, and it's milk filling in the middle. What is milk filling? It's like a it's like a chewy bar that tastes like licorice. I don't know what, what they're trying to, but you know, they're not half bad, okay? But then seafood, you like seafood? Why eat real seafood when there's imitation crab? Listen, it says on the package, contains no real crab. <laughs> then what does it contain, you know? <laughs> they, they should just say instructions, eat near toilet, because you know, that's what is <laughs> gonna happen. Uh, but my favorite, my favorite is this one. Anybody like bacon and eggs? Okay, but we don't really need them anymore. There's now egg and bacon bit powder. Just add water and cook in the skillet. Mmm. If you have the skillet anyway, why not just eat bacon and eggs? You know? This is crazy to me. And substitutions are by definition not the real thing. Listen, in our life, we settle for a lot of substitutes. Money. Money is a wonderful tool. It's a terrible God, terrible God to worship. Some choose to substitute other relationships in place of the relationship that they should have with the Lord. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have relationships, but you can't put that, any other relationship in God's place. You can't put it before God. And yet some of us try to fill that hole with a boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, whatever the case, and everybody's dissatisfied. Some try to fill that God-shaped hole with an addiction. Whatever it is in your life you put first over him, it's a man-made substitute. And I'll say it again, substitutes can never satisfy. Gomer looked to substitutes, blind to the love she had right at home. She, She looked to substitute lovers to satisfy, thinking that they would care for her, they would protect her. When she had a loving husband at home, begging her for the opportunity to do just that. And Hosea got to learn firsthand how it breaks the heart of God as his people turn their backs on him over and over and over and over again and look to other things to satisfy. Kyle Eidelman in his book, Gods at War, uh, says there are all kinds of gods fighting for our hearts. And he lists things like maybe one of these is yours. He talks about comfort, money, sex, prestige, fashion, pleasure, legalism, family, fame, perfect body, perfect health. Eidelman suggests questions to ask yourself to try to figure out where your heart really is. Questions like, what do, you, uh, what do you sacrifice for? What makes you mad? What do you worry about? Who do you want praising you? These are the questions that reveal who or what it is in our lives that we are at risk of worshiping in God's place. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of convicted right now, and I'm the one preaching And if the sermon ended right here, 
If the story ended right here, we could have an altar call. We could come down here. We get on our faces before God with heavy hearts, aware of how often we have turned away. We have cheated on God. We could have that conversation. But the thing is, the story's not over. In fact, it's just, it's just about to get good. Flip over to Hosea chapter 3, starting with verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, go and love your wife again, even though she commits adultery with another lover. This will illustrate that the Lord still loves Israel, even though the people have turned to other gods and love to worship them. Listen, God says to him, love even if you aren't loved back. In spite of how she's hurt him, in spite of how she's treated her children, in spite of how she's lived her life, Hosea still loves his wife. He still loves her. So when commanded to go after her, he doesn't even hesitate because he loves her so much and because he wants to stay faithful to God. He still loved her in spite of her sin. And his love is so great, he's willing to do whatever it takes to bring her back to himself. Now listen, that is the picture God wanted Israel to see. The betrayal is what God, the conviction God wanted Israel to feel. But this redemption is the picture that God wanted Israel to see. No one has to tell God to love you. He loved you before you were born. He loved you uh, when you were a sweet little baby. Pastor Nick, who leads uh, worship here at the downtown campus, uh, him and his wife Sarah just had a baby. She's like a week old, she, ten, 10 days. She's so sweet. He loved you when you were a little baby. He also loved you in that moment when you chose rebellion over faithfulness. And by the way, you have chosen it. When you chose sin over righteousness. And wherever you are today, he has always loved you. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 about that love. He says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in this unseen world. Maybe you still do. He's the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But watch. But God is so rich in mercy. And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. Folks, God will always love you. He will always love you. You can ignore him, and he loves you. You may decide you don't have time for him, and he loves you. You may turn a deaf ear to his cries, but he doesn't stop calling you home because he loves you. He will always, always love you. Listen, I get it. Gomer, she thought she was doing the right thing. She thought she was better off without Hosea. When she left, she thought it was for the best. And after leaving Hosea's home, Gomer passed from man to man to man until she fell into the hands of a man who couldn't even provide for her basic needs, so he sells her like a piece of property. And finally, God gives Hosea permission to go get her, and he's ready and willing. Look at verse 2 of chapter 3. So I bought her back for 15 pieces of silver, five bushels of barley, and a measure of wine. Now listen, that is a throwaway verse if you don't know what you're listening for, but please understand the impact of what I just read. In fact, there's no way that I can do this justice. There's no way I can fully express it. So I, I, wanna, I want you to watch this video from Judah Smith, and perhaps you'll get just a glimpse of what is happening. Watch this with me. Hosea chapter 3, verse 1. Then the Lord said to me, Go again, Hosea. What? Go find her. Love this woman who's loved by a lover and is right now committing adultery. Go find her, Hosea. Go find her. Look what's after the comma. Just like the love of the Lord for Israel. I love her. Now, where it says Israel, it means Israel, but it also prophetically speaks of God's love for the whole world. Go find her again. 
this, this is like my love for the children of Israel who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. In other words, they like the things that society stuff possessions that the world offers. They're trying to find love and meaning and purpose in that. Go, go, go find her. Boy, that must have been a heart-wrenching process. As you go looking for your wife, who was a former prostitute, who's now back into prostitution, where do you go looking for her, friends? How messy is that search? How painful is that pursuit? As he walks the streets, streets, everyone says you don't go to those neighborhoods. Men of God should never be seen in those places and buildings. But here's Hosea looking for who? His wife of all people. Going on in verse 2, he continues to write, so I bought her. I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and one half homers of barley. Wait, 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 wait. She's your wife, Hosea. She's already yours. What was the scene like as Gomer's back in the sex slave industry? What are the chances? Does Gomer find her on some pedestal somewhere, chained and shackled, naked, being sold to the highest bidder? Hosea there sees his wife, the mother of their three children, and Hosea looks at her and says, excuse me, sir, that's my wife. He goes, sir, I don't care who you think she is. This is her price. But I, hey, what's the price? And he pays for what is already his. The Bible says, I hope you understand, Hosea is a picture of God, and no offense, you and I are a picture of Gomer. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Mankind is the unique possession of the Creator God. And yet, 2,000 years ago, he paid a dear price. He paid for what he already possessed. And he sent his son who spilled his blood to purchase back what he already owned. How much? Hosea gets the money. What was that exchange like when Hosea looked in the eyes of his wife? No doubt she hung her head in embarrassment. He's found me. I've abandoned him. I've abandoned our three kids. And yet he insists on buying me. Buying me. As these other men sought to buy her, to use her. Hosea seeks to buy her, to heal her. Do you feel that? Do you see that? This whole thing doesn't even make sense. It does not make sense for a man to pay to keep a woman who's betrayed him, but that's exactly what's happening here. It's easy to hear the story and point to Gomer, but we're Gomer. Every blessing we have in our lives, we receive from the hand of God, and yet how easily we forget this and we bite the hand that feeds us. This exchange cost Hosea far more than his money. It cost him his pride. He had to go into a public setting before witnesses to buy back his own wife, a woman who had betrayed him many times. And his actions are a picture of what God has done for us. We're all slaves to sin, but God in his grace and mercy sent Jesus in the world to pay the price for our sins, a price that we can never pay on our own. Jesus willingly suffered pain and shame and humiliation to redeem you, to buy you back. Folks, the love of God is profoundly undeserved. Do we understand this? The love of God is profoundly undeserved. Every one of us is a Gomer. Every one of us hears the story of the love of God and then we walk out of churches and we live like a Gomer. There is unfaithfulness in every one of us. None of us have earned this. His love is shocking and it is scandalous because it violates what is fair. 
Anyone who saw Hosea buy back Gomer, anyone who saw this love for her would have considered the whole thing disgraceful. Why? Because they understood we want to love and we want to be loved in return. And now we're hearing that, there is a, that God Almighty loves us so much that he loves us knowing we won't love him in return, knowing we won't offer it back. He's given us a choice and many don't choose him. And yet he freely offers it to anyone who believes. I am so, so thankful for God's undeserved love. Now we're going to turn it over to the campus pastors to wrap it up, but first there are two critical lessons in this story that I think we need to see today. The first is this, the love of God never changes, never changes. Maybe you're in here, you've come to know God, you've already put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're a Christ follower, but if you're honest with yourself, you've wandered, you've wandered lately. And what God wants you to hear today in this place is that he has redeemed you. He has bought you back you are his, and he's calling you to come back and live with him in faithfulness. God's saying, in spite of what you've done, I long for you to come back fully. I long for you to love me fully as I love you. And because you love me fully, I long for you to love other people enough that you're willing to share that love with them, to, to share your faith, to invite them to church, to be in their lives. Which leads to the second lesson. The love of God never, ever gives up. For those of you who have not put your faith in Jesus, you may find yourself at times feeling deserted and wondering, well, if there is a God, where is he in all of this? Let me be clear. God is not lost. You are. God has not wandered. You have. And yet, he loved you so much, he purchased your freedom on the cross through his son, Jesus Christ. And he's pursuing you right now. He's waiting for you to respond, to return to his love. He's waiting for you to cast yourself upon his grace. You see, the story of Hosea and Gomer reminds us that God loves us not because of our faithfulness, but because of his. 